facts, the known photograph of Mengele. The executioner in chief of mass murder, he had the principal part in the, in the founding solution, in the wiping out of the Jewish people. He was one of the uh, most responsible for the killing of millions because Mengele was the personification of evil. And he was described by all the survivors as the angel of death. He was the cruelest man in the world. Not in Auschwitz, not only in Auschwitz. I think there doesn't exist a God creation that would be more cruel as he was. I met Mengele the first time in 49. He was a brilliant man from an intellectual point of view, a good philosopher, historian, a very good medical man. He uh, was impressive, that is the truth. Even Jewish uh, inmates told me, you should believe me, they told me, he looked nice. He was, as you said, elegant. Dr. Joseph Mengele. German war criminals who are still free expect to be safe as from next year, but not Mengele. His crimes are such that the law granting freedom from prosecution after 30 years will not apply to him. Tonight, World in Action sets out to explore why have the German and Israeli governments been unable to bring him to justice? Who is protecting him? Is he really still alive? Where is he? Hitler saw Auschwitz as the most efficient system he had for killing Jews and other undesirables. Mengele, as a geneticist, saw it as a vast laboratory with unlimited human material for experiments. There he set out to prove scientifically that Jews were an inferior race. Their first encounter with Dr. Mengele was when the train pulled in at Auschwitz. And we stepped down from those cattle trains and we came straight to those selections through the doctors. We stand in front of Dr. Mengele, which that time I didn't know that is the name of Dr. Mengele. He pointed out with his thumb one to the right, one to the left. To the right, it meant life, to the left, meant death. And this is the way we remained in life, through Dr. Mengele. The old ones, they went to the left immediately, to the left meant death. Children, this was his first thing, to destroy the children. Immediately he pointed out to the left. They described him as a man who was not engaged in his... It was more routine selecting the, uh, in, the, when they arrived at the ramp with the trains. He made it with a routine. Distance, like this, science, uh, whistling something, melodies of some operas, Tosca or so. How did he strike you? Extremely handsome, like a film star. We called him Rudolf Valentino. Everyone, yes. But he never, never looked nobody in his eyes. Mengele spared few at the railhead. Margaret Englander and her daughter were among the lucky ones. Struck by their beauty, Mengele set them to work for him instead. For over a year, Margaret Englander was his clerk at selection time. So he said, it's all right. Uh, she should stay, yes. And my child became his messenger. This is between thousands and thousands, one child remained in life. Mengele was doctor in charge of the women's and children's camp. Some women he spared at the railhead for work. Later, when they grew too weak, he selected them to die. Because Margaret Englander saw these selections, she is now West Germany's chief prosecution witness against Mengele. The selection started at 5 o'clock in the morning in front of the barracks. There have been 28 barracks. In front of every barrack, there have been women standing in a nude. 
clipped off hairs, standing in a row, again all nude, all women. Many times women whom they knew already where they are going fell on the knee to him and uh, they were asking and pleading to him for life. He looked mostly on the bodies and when he saw a, a woman was pregnant, he put on a, with a red pencil a cross of the chest. It meant dead. He just wanted to destroy those women who have been pregnant. Did he speak to the women when he selected them for life or death? Never. To nobody. He didn't open his mouth. Never. Mengele's medical experiments were a personal obsession, started before the war at Frankfurt's Institute of Racial Purity. Wounded on the Russian front in 1943, he asked to be posted to Auschwitz to continue his laboratory research. He was fiercely ambitious to rise in the Nazi party. Mengele wanted to be the first scientist to prove the Führer's racist theory that Jews were subhuman. Mengele also wanted to breed a master race of blue-eyed, blonde-haired Germans. This meant he had to study how natural characteristics can be altered, and for that he needed twins. This special compound, Block C, was found full of twins at the end of the war. Mengele studied twins to learn which qualities could be developed from identical raw material. He made comparative studies on pairs of twins by dissecting them dead and alive. If a twin died of, say, a brain disorder, Mengele shot the surviving twin to see if it too showed signs of the disorder. And a lot of witnesses told me when transport were arriving at the uh, rail station and he was present at the ramp, on the ramp, he was crying, uh, twins, twins, Zwillinge, Zwillinge. And everybody knew in Auschwitz at that time that it was Mengele who was the one who was interested. It was, uh, I would say, for someone it seemed to be crazy, twins, twins, twins. He made experiments on twins and he took one day uh, four children with him in his car and gave them chocolate and many things that children like. And in the middle of the row he took out his revolver and he shot them. Can you list the experiments he did? Well, uh, he, the eyes, the twins, the gypsies. What did he do with the eyes? They have been placed in uh, special uh, medication. In a glass jar they kept them. Mengele believed that he might change the pigmentation of people's eyes through injecting dyes, with blue for preference, an important feature of his perfect German specimen. Four years ago, former Jewish prisoner Dr. Wechsler Janku gave this evidence to the West German investigating judge. In June 1943, I went to the gypsy camp in Birkenau. I saw a wooden table. On it, there were samples of eyes. They had a number each and a letter. The eyes were from very pale yellow to bright blue, violet, green and grey. Do you think that Mengele was a sadist? No. No. I, I think I'm sure he was not a sadist. And I have proof from my comrades who has uh, uh, observed him by his work. He was not a man der durch seine Triebe gezwungen war, das zu machen. Er war ein Mann, der durch seinen Intellekt bewogen wurde, das zu machen. Das ist meiner Meinung nach viel schlimmer. But he seems a uniquely mysterious man. He's not a sadist. He gives children sweets and then he kills them. What sense do you make of that? What sense do you make about the atrocities of the Nationalsozialist? Not all the Nationalsozialist was sadist. And they make, they make the murders of millions. So and they make the murders of millions with, with einem guten Gewissen. My feeling was that he was always looking for a, a scientific reason uh, why anti-Semitism was a need for Germany at that time. I believe he sterilized your daughter. But through an injection. As I said, that we have been just lucky. He finally selected her to die. Yes. He selected her to die. Two days later, we have been liberated.
Mengele fled Auschwitz in January 1945, just before the Russians liberated the camp. In the final hours, Mengele tried to destroy evidence of his fearful work. When did you last see Dr. Mengele? He came with other, uh, with other doctors. He looked around and the other doctors remained in the lager in Auschwitz. He disappeared completely. The next day we didn't see him anymore. Did he leave any evidence of his work? As far as I know, no, nothing at all. When Auschwitz was liberated, Mengele slipped away. Within a year, he was named as a major war criminal at the Nuremberg War Crimes Trial by the Auschwitz camp commandant himself. The SS embarked on a series of experiments on human beings which were performed on prisoners of war or concentration camp inmates. These experiments included freezing to death and killing by poison bullets. The SS had access to human material after Nuremberg, the Allies showed no interest in Mengele, despite the Commandant's disclosure. Nor did the West Germans, now responsible for war crime prosecutions. More and more details of his atrocities emerged, and still the prosecutor did nothing. For 13 years, no official attempt was made even to find him. It was left to one man, Hermann Langbein, who arrived at the Bonn Justice Ministry in September 1958 with a case against Mengele. Langbein had spent three years as a clerk in the Auschwitz chief doctor's office and was determined to bring Mengele to justice. But at first, the Bonn officials ignored his dossier of evidence. What happened when you presented your dossier of evidence against Mengele to the German justice ministry in Bonn in 1958? His answer, uh, he is not responsible for this question. It is a question from one of the 11 states of Germany. And he asked me in what state is Mengele born, in what he was living. And I can't answer. The German justice in this time has no interest uh, at all the uh, trials against uh, Nazi uh, murderers. But five days later, Langbein did discover where Mengele was born. He found a scientific paper written by Joseph Mengele. I have uh, heard in Frankfurt from a woman who was also a prisoner in Auschwitz and uh, with, him, with her I have spoken about the case Mengele and the other cases, that uh, uh, she has uh, found in a book, in a scientific book, the name of Mengele and there was written the date of the birth of Mengele and the uh, city where Mengele was born, Günzburg. Allied and West German government indifference wasn't the only reason for Mengele's freedom. Gunzburg, a small town in Bavaria, was dominated then and still is today by Mengele's father's firm, Karl Mengele and Son, farm machinery manufacturers. In such a place, Mengele could hide and few would dare inform on the boss's son. World in Action discovered that Mengele lived safely in the family house for the first four years after the war. Horst Seidelmeier, an ex-Mengele company director, also confirmed this to Judge von Glasnap in his investigation. And he told me that Mengele came to Günzburg after the war. I cannot exactly say at the time, uh, but uh, there was no problem, so, so far as I know now. It seemed no, it was no problem that Mengele uh, was there, and then he left. Why, why, why was there no problem about Mengele? Because nobody was interested for him. You must know the impact of the Mengele family in Günzburg, the most important family of the whole town. All people work for Mengele there. Early in 1959, Langbein made an even more important discovery. Mengele had fled to South America. A short time after this, I have learned uh, that uh, Mengele has divorced his first wife, in uh, Düsseldorf, and uh, that uh, his lawyer has a paper uh, signed by Mengele, and there is written Buenos Aires. And uh, this is a sign that he is living in Argentina or in Buenos Aires uh, direct. Mengele had been hiding in Buenos Aires since 1949. It was here in 1959, ten years after he arrived, that the hunt for Mengele really began. 
He evidently felt safe since in 1956 he approached the West German Embassy there and applied in his own name to be registered as a permanent resident. World in Action learned that Mengler had entered Argentina on this false international Red Cross passport, first issued in Genoa, Italy in 1949 in the name of Ludwig Gregor. This is not in fact a picture of Mengler who looked more like this in 1949. Instead, police experts think it's an early shot of the man on the right, Mengler's younger brother Alwaz. According to a handwriting expert, material grounds exist to show that the signature Gregor was written by Mengler himself. Mengler even felt secure enough in 1956 to submit this real picture of himself, now with a moustache, to the German embassy in Buenos Aires. He told the embassy he'd been using the false name Gregor and his real name was Joseph Mengler. The embassy apparently helped him get an Argentine identity card. Mengler settled in the fashionable Buenos Aires suburb of Vicente Lopez, where he bought a house here in Tucumán Street. He often used his own name and openly took out a mortgage as Joseph Mengler. Dutch-born Wilhelm Sassens, sentenced to death in Belgium as a member of the Nazi counter-espionage organization, the Abwehr, has known Mengler since 1949. Sassens, on the left, a former SS captain, twice escaped from Allied jails. He fled to Buenos Aires, where he now lives. There, Sassens helped Nazi fugitives to escape with forged papers. And there, he first met Joseph Mengler. I knew him. Uh, I met Mengler the first time in '49. He was a brilliant man, from an intellectual point of view, a good philosopher, historian, a very good medical man. So if you take his case and you see the stories, the horrible stories they are talking about, uh, selecting eyes and I don't know all what, uh, there's, no, there's no mean, that we have no means at our disposal to uh, prove the contrary. If you take the fact that this man, whom I knew really closely, I can say, uh, and who taught me about his experiments he had done during the war, experiments, for example, with volunteers, crippled people and other people, uh, out of the armed forces of Germany, in order to know how man reacts under circumstances of duress, such as cold or heat or water or whatever it may be, experiments which are up to date continued by the Americans in the Panama section or anti-guerrilla warfare section, the British commandos and so on. So uh, those experiments uh, were of course uh, done by on, on, on the bodies of those uh, volunteers. Uh, now there's another question that it seems that uh, those experiences were as well done with uh, prisoners. Uh, of course, uh, there is no proof of it. Mengele established himself as owner of a small textile factory in Buenos Aires. We discovered he struck up a remarkable acquaintance with a German Jewish businessman who discussed the possibility of partnership with Mengele's firm, cited in this street. The Jewish businessman knew Mengele only by his false name of Gregor. He told us that Gregor was getting money from his father, whom he met on a secret visit to Switzerland in 1958. He also remarked that Gregor seemed to be suffering from a guilt complex. At the same time, Gregor was going by his real name of Mengler at regular rendezvous at this German restaurant on another side of Buenos Aires. There, Mengele, for the first time, met his former overlord and fellow fugitive Adolf Eichmann, mastermind of Hitler's plan to wipe out the Jews. SS man Wilhelm Sassens was then working with Eichmann preparing favorable propaganda to cover up what happened in Nazi concentration camps. How well did you know him? Who? Oh. I think I knew him completely. What did you make of him? Uh, a tragical figure. A tragical figure, because he was really not, it was not, not his business in reality. He would have liked to be a common soldier on the front. That was his dream. But unknown to both Eichmann and Mengele, their capture was being plotted in Europe and Israel. The West German authorities, after more persuasion, issued this arrest warrant for Mengele in June 1959, following Hermann Langbein's discovery that he was now in Buenos Aires. 
And agents from the Israeli secret service Mossad were watching this house in Buenos Aires. As an astonished world later learned, the Israelis kidnapped its tenant, Adolf Eichmann, to stand trial in Jerusalem. But first they held him in a secret house in Buenos Aires. But few people know the Israelis nearly pulled off a second coup by capturing Mengele as well, with Eichmann's help. Isa Harel, Mossad chief, led the hunt in the city. It was only, only after this operation was assured that we could turn to Mengele. Before uh, departing for Argentina on the Eichmann operation, I uh, looked through the whole, uh, the files of all the major war criminals who were believed to have escaped to South America. And in particular, I studied on the dossier of Mengele. This was the dossier that Harrell had built up on Mengele. Round-faced, able to create impression of gentle, well-mannered man. Appearance not typically German, closer to Mediterranean type. Height, 174 centimetres. Hair, chestnut, straight, front wave. Eyes, bright blue, smiling, almond formed, probing eyes of striking beauty. Harel held Eichmann in the Buenos Aires hideout, interrogated him about Mengele, and discovered the curious power Mengele now had over his wartime overlord. At the moment the name of Mengele was mentioned, uh, Eichmann went into a panic and he refused to tell us anything about uh, Mengele. Uh, he was just, it wasn't out of sense of loyalty or something like this. I think it was just of sheer funk, of sheer uh, fright. Why do you think Eichmann was frightened of Mengele? I'm not sure, but uh, he might be supported by him. Or he might be just uh, afraid of him because he was a powerful, a, a very, uh, uh, maybe a strong personality amongst the uh, Nazi refugees in, uh, in South America. But uh, eventually he told us something. He mentioned uh, the name of a certain boarding house. And we understood that it was uh, a refuge for war criminals. And it might be that Mengele found a refuge there. He admitted to us that Mengele had been in Buenos Aires and it's what encouraged me to try to uh, check on the house. I was considering a commando operation on the house with the object of uh, checking the identity of all the tenants of the house. And if Mengele was there, just to take him by force. What I had in mind was to bring Mengele to the plane uh, just before takeoff once Eichmann was already uh, safely on board and to put him just the last moment and uh, this was my, my, uh, my plan but unfortunately it didn't, it didn't work this way out because the last minute check on the house proved beyond any doubt that indeed uh, Mengele left the place a little while ago. How many weeks before? A couple, only a couple of weeks ago. How is it that a, a man like Mengele hasn't been caught, whereas a man like Eichmann was caught? You know, I've been on the run myself a uh, long time enough in order to know um, that you can't, you can't say why this one uh, yes and this other one no. I mean, there's a lot of, of luck by it as well, and a lot of, a lot of course, of, of, of brains as well. And uh, I, I suppose there's just... Uh, I mean, they are two completely different kinds of people, uh, Eichmann and, and Mengele. So, uh, uh, moreover, uh, Mengele does dispose of... of uh, could dispose of all means, so, uh, which Eichmann never had. And uh, so that can facilitate in some way, not in a basic way, but in some way it can facilitate, let's say, this uh, continuous uh, moving around. But the Germans were now trying. In June 1959, the West German Embassy in Buenos Aires asked for the extradition of Joseph Mengele. In response to the request, this Argentinian judge, Jorge Luque, sent two policemen to arrest Mengele at a new address. The police reported back that he'd escaped. Judge Luque told us he thinks that Mengele bribed the police to say he'd fled. Mengele had moved his home from Argentina. He fled across the border to neighbouring Paraguay, wanted by the West Germans, the Israeli Secret Service and now the Argentine police. 
Unlike Eichmann, Mengele was a step ahead of his hunters. He'd made an earlier trip to the Paraguayan capital to befriend influential Nazis close to President Stresner, military dictator of Paraguay, and he'd acquired Paraguayan citizenship. In part two, we show how, in the face of all efforts to find Mengele, President Stresner has personally shielded the SS doctor. Joseph Mengele, the SS doctor of Auschwitz, believed he'd be safe in Paraguay because of President Stresner's ideology and his German background. Like Mengele, Stresner's family came from Bavaria, birthplace of Nazism. The president still admires many wartime Nazi commanders. Men like Colonel Hans Rudel, on the left here, who was Hitler's most decorated wartime pilot and now one of President Stresner's closest friends and confidants. Rudel once ran an escape organization for Nazis to South America. Today in Germany, he still has strong pro-Nazi links. Rudel used his influence with President Stresner to help smooth Mengele's path when he first fled to the safety of Paraguay. More recently, publicly defended Mengele. In 1971, Rudel wrote, Mengele has suffered enough. There is no proof that he did what he's accused of. This document, first acquired by World in Action, is proof of Mengele's Paraguayan citizenship. He got it with the help of influential Nazis in Paraguay who falsely stated in 1959 that Mengele had already lived there for five years. This is a signature of one of the Supreme Court judges who granted Mengele citizenship, Luis Martinez Miltos, now a Paraguayan envoy to the Vatican, seen here presenting his credentials to the late Pope Paul. The men who put their signature to Mengele's false testimony were Werner Jung and Alejandro von Eckstein, both Nazis and friends of Stresner. Alejandro von Eckstein is a senior member of Stresner's intelligence service and works on the second floor of this Ministry of Defence building. He's a lifelong friend of Stresner and a palace visitor, as this guest list shows. Werner Jung, the other Nazi who signed Mengele's citizenship paper, is a former Hitler youth leader. Through him, Mengele got all the cash he needed. Money from Mengele's family firm in Germany was channeled through Ferreteria Alemania, a hardware business once owned by Jung in the Paraguayan capital, Asuncion. Today the firm still sells Mengele family products. It's run by another Nazi, Werner Schubayas, an admirer of Mengele who used to see him regularly. We filmed him with a hidden camera in this Asuncion restaurant. At times, filming in Paraguay was dangerous, and to film some conversations we had to use subterfuge. We built a camera into a bag and strapped tiny recorders under our clothes. A German woman working with our investigating team infiltrated the Paraguay Nazi community. We secretly filmed this conversation she had in the restaurant with Werner Schubayas, Mengele's friend. Yes, of course. Of course. Yes, we knew the story. Not at all. When we met him, we said he can't possibly have done that. Yes, I'm convinced of that. If he has done something, it's only because he was acting under orders. I can imagine Mengele only as a human being. As a human being, he has my sympathy. But like everybody else, modest, educated, very well educated man much more than we are. Yes, by all means. Well, the whole story was a heavy burden for him. Nothing. He had a check. Mengele bought a house in this Asuncion street, and there he was planning to set up a pharmacy business. What he didn't realize was that the Israeli Secret Service had tracked him here from Buenos Aires. Do you recall inquiring about a pharmacy in Asuncion? Oh, yes, it reminds me that I, uh, I remember sending uh, people to check on a certain pharmacy. I don't remember exactly what was the purpose of it, but it had some connection with Mengele. Possibly, Mengele got wind of this. From now on, he kept moving, first to the quiet border town of Encarnacion, with Argentina on the far bank, easily accessible by boat across the river Parana.
Border refuges like this were to become the pattern of Mengele's hideouts. Despite the security of his Paraguayan citizenship, Mengele feared the same fate as Adolf Eichmann at the hands of the Israeli Secret Service. Mengele chose this area for its large German population, where he found sympathy and understanding from many fellow Nazis. The houses and atmosphere are much like pre-war Germany. These are German settlers celebrating a midsummer ritual popular in Hitler's Nazi Germany, but now banned in West Germany because of that. Mengele knew that he could remain hidden among these people, many of whom had fled to South America like himself. Named the Hotel Tyrol, this German-style hotel in the area has become a meeting place for Nazis. Alfredo Stresner, the Paraguayan president, is also a frequent visitor. It's owned by Armando Reinartz, a Belgian who turned traitor and joined the Nazi Waffen-SS during the war. We filmed Reinhardt secretly at his hotel. He confirmed that Mengele had stayed there. He just dropped in. I can't say very much. I didn't know him very well. Just casually. Yes, a nice man. He was a doctor here. Yes, why not? I must live from my hotel. If a man turns up at my hotel and he comes here, he's accepted. What was this man accused of? He was a doctor in the camps. We always hear the rubbish that you probably know was written in the newspapers. Now that's rubbish. I don't believe that. Mengele also hid in this remote farmhouse 20 miles from the Hotel Tyrol for several months in 1962. The home of German Alban Krug, its humble appearance belies his position as one of the key helpers in the escape of Nazis to the German colony in southern Paraguay. Alban Krug gave shelter to other Nazis who were on the run. Unknown to Krug, we managed to record a conversation with him with our hidden camera, but Krug hedged questions about his friendship with Mengele. I am not allowed to say. Who can guarantee that? You believe that a man like Mengele came here, or it has even been said that I had Bormann here. My house was a strange house, you can believe me. My house was a place where people, no matter where they came from, they, they came to me. In the same way as you come to me now. They came to me for a reason, mostly when they had no money. At that time I was famous, and hard times were hard. I've saved many people, mainly Europeans and Germans from the Third Reich, from the police, when they were trying to blackmail them. And I was a famous man and I had a big house. Whether Mengele stayed with me, no one can say. Nobody ever introduced himself to me as Mengele. I can't tell you that either. I don't know whether it was Mengele. Reinartz, the SS owner of the Hotel Tyrol, was quite certain of Krug's help for Mengele. A local German pastor in the area since the war confirmed the story too. <laughs> Mengele lived with Alban Krug. Alban Krug lived out at Hohenau 5, that is 23 kilometers from the center of Hohenau. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Another group of people had tracked Mengele down to Krug's remote farmhouse. Issa Harel's Israeli agents moved quietly into the area. They discovered that since the Eichmann kidnapping, Mengele now had armed guards. How long were your men operational in Encarnacion? It was a question of months. Until they came to the conclusion that uh, indeed he was living on a certain farm in the uh, a desolate farm near the uh, Encarnacion. But how can Israelis infiltrate such a heavily populated area of Germans? By, by cover. Uh, never, never, they never appeared as, as Israelis. Uh, this area was full of uh, Nazi supporters and, uh, of course, friends of, uh, of the Nazi war criminals and, of course, of Mengele. He had uh, bodyguards and uh, lookouts armed and sometimes also accompanied by dogs and uh, a very kind of strongholds which uh, could be only stormed by armed force. Do you think Mengele was being protected with the blessing of the president? Of course he was protected. He might be protected by 
by certain uh, influential personalities in the district. It might be. But as in a dictatorship, as it was in Paraguay, um, we could uh, suppose that it was with some, somehow with a blessing of higher authority, but uh, I can't say more. Did you consider a commando operation on Mengele's hideout in southern Paraguay? Not, because all these uh, hideouts were strongholds and they could have been uh, stormed only by armed force. And this, of course, was out of the question in the uh, situation at the time. Uh, so I gave up. Alban Krug, while he was being filmed by our hidden camera, talked of the kind of protection that he had surrounding his farm at the time. I wouldn't advise anyone to start anything with me, I can tell you that. Anyone who laid hands on me wouldn't get out of here alive. He wouldn't get out of here alive. Yes, yes. People do talk about that. They do indeed. Many people came here to spy on me. Yes, yes. Krug's protection signalled the end of the Israelis' attempts to capture Mengele alive. We believe Harel was left with one alternative, to assassinate Mengele. But Harel's later resignation over another issue ended his plans to infiltrate a killer into Mengele's circle of friends. The West German embassy were now active in the hunt. By 1963, members of the staff had tracked Mengele to the same dense jungle region as the Israelis. There, they discovered that for the first time since he fled Auschwitz, Mengele had returned to medicine. Officials learned that Mengele, calling himself Dr. Jose, had treated a woman patient. She was then told by a Nazi friend of the doctor's real identity. Mengele's practice was in Capitan Mesa, 20 miles from Krug's fortified farm. Some of Mengele's patients were Germans and Nazi settlers and their families who still dominate the area today. Issa Harrell remembered Mengele's work as a doctor too. We had information with regard this that Mengele used to uh, his, uh, his experience as a doctor to uh, make some, some practice, maybe, maybe on his uh, Nazi friends who couldn't uh, turn to, to the regular uh, medicine help. Again, Mengele's hideout was on the river Piranha, should he need to make a quick move to Argentina on the far bank. The area also has many military zones that could afford Mengele extra protection. The Israelis' earlier belief that Mengele was protected by President Stroessner's own men signalled a political row that has lasted till today. In 1964, the German embassy in Asuncion asked the Paraguayan government for Mengele's extradition. President Stroessner declared Mengele untouchable because of his Paraguayan citizenship. In a face-to-face -face confrontation, the German ambassador, Eckhard Briest, asked the president to overcome this by stripping Mengele of that citizenship. Stroessner threw a rage. He said that the Paraguayan nation had been insulted. The diplomatic row forced Ambassador Briest to leave his post prematurely. With a £14,000 West German government reward on his head, Mengele kept moving. In 1966, he was tracked to the Argentine town of El Dorado after crossing the river from Paraguay. There, a Brazilian took this remarkable clip of film of Joseph Mengele from a car. Run a second time in slow motion, we see Mengele turn and look straight at the camera. Alone and without a bodyguard, Mengele doesn't challenge the photographer but walks on. Run a third time, identification as Mengele has been confirmed by both German and Israeli intelligence, checking the skull outline and ear shape against earlier photographs. Meanwhile, a complete change in Israel's attitude towards Mengele took place. In 1968, they opened an embassy in the Paraguayan capital. Israel went flat out to court President Stroessner, Paraguay's dictator and Mengele's protector. Branded by the Russians as the aggressor after the Six-Day War, Israel badly needed UN votes and Paraguay had just been elected to the UN Security Council. The new ambassador, Benjamin Veron, had to forget all about Mengele and befriend Stroessner. I didn't think of, of, of Mengele when I received my mission there. I didn't really think of him when I arrived there. Nobody in our foreign office thought of it. Nobody spoke to me about it. There were no instructions of any kind. I was sent with a certain mission. What do, what do you understand by that? <laughs> well, I was sent there to, to create friends and to influence people. Baron was ambassador to Paraguay from 1968 to 1972. 
He believed Mengele was still in Paraguay during this time. While you were there, did you believe Mengele was also in Paraguay? The Paraguayan authorities reacted to news items which appeared from time to time in the international press that Mengele was in Paraguay. They were annoyed about it. Annoyed, but not that much that they would ever deny. They never denied his presence? No. No. And what do you take that to mean? That he may have had at that time one of his homes in Paraguay. Discreet inquiries by the German embassy revealed that Mengler had to change his lifestyle in the late 60s. Three German ambassadors, including the last one, Helmut Hoff, told us that President Stresner himself ordered Mengele to keep away from the capital, Asuncion, and change his name and his appearance. Worldwide interest had made Mengele a political embarrassment to Stresner. Can you describe the time when the Paraguayan foreign minister suggested that the issue of Mengele might best be dealt with by Israeli commandos? Well, he didn't speak about of Israeli commandos. Uh, at one of our meetings where he expressed his unhappiness about this matter popping up ever always again in the press he said ambassador you understand this is really not a question for diplomats it's a question for commandos perhaps he his subconscious spoke and said let's get rid of the man take him away take him off our hands that may have been his innermost feeling Nevertheless, West Germany pursued Mengele through the courts. Judge von Glasenapp had been preparing a prosecution case against him. In 1974, Mengele's brother, Alwaz, died in Germany. Von Glasenapp thought Mengele might attend the funeral because Alwaz had always financed his fugitive brother. It's the death of his brother. That could be uh, an event that Mengele wished to attend the funeral, at least, in spite of the fact that the situation was dangerous. And so I ordered that the criminal police watch the funerals. You ordered his family's telephone to be tapped? No comment. There's a secret of office. No, we have the right to, t to, uh, to uh, control telephone. But there was no success at all. Nothing happened. No voices on the line? Nothing. Silence on the Western, quiet on the Western Front. The attempted assassination by a Nazi gang of the Jewish owner of this shop last year led to a bizarre chain of events that indicates Stroessner still has enough sympathy to protect Mengele. Emilio Wolf, an Auschwitz survivor, came to Paraguay after the war and opened a butcher's shop there. His mistake last year was to say that he could identify a war criminal in Paraguay. Edward Roshman, former commandant of the Riga extermination camp, fled to Paraguay in 1977. He featured in Frederick Forsyth's novel, The Odessa File. The real-life Roshman, a sick man, admitted himself under a false name to Asuncion's public hospital where he died. For several days, the corpse's identity was a mystery. It was rumoured to be Roshman. Then Wolf publicly claimed he could identify the corpse. That same night, gunmen sprayed the front of his apartment above his shop with bullets from a passing car. We tape recorded this interview with Emilio Wolf. Haben Sie irgendeine Ahnung, wer dieses Attentat könnte? Ja, das ist von die yes. people from the Odessa, Odessa. the Nazi Odessa. escape yeah. organization. We even had letters from Germany, from people in Frankfurt saying this would not be the last time. The Roshman incident provoked a circulation battle between Paraguay's two main daily papers. The ABC newspaper first published the Roshman story. The rival newspaper, Hoy, owned by Stresner's son-in-law, Domingos Dib, retaliated by publishing a middle-page spread on another famous war criminal, Joseph Mengele. Stresner was furious. He banned the next day's follow-up story on Mengele when he heard Dib's plans to publish two locations where Mengele sometimes hid, both in border military zones. As Stresner's son-in-law, Domingos Dib, privy to the family secret on Mengele, had overstepped the mark in the circulation battle. This whole Roshman incident and the ensuing row about Mengele prompted the German embassy to renew pressure for Mengele's extradition. Last autumn, the head of the consular section met a senior official in the interior ministry run by Savino Montanaro. 
Montanaro instructed his official to deny any knowledge of Mengler's whereabouts. So it was an assassination attempt on a Jewish butcher, foolish enough to talk about Nazis, that reopened speculation about Mengele last year. That shooting also gave us our first report of direct contact with Mengele today. A Nazi gang in the capital was responsible for the shooting. Their leader is a German who came to Paraguay, Enrique Muller, widely known in Asuncion as Nazi Muller. While we were filming him with our hidden camera in a restaurant, he said that he sees Mengele every month. Yes, every week, every month. That's the way people get interrogated. We meet regularly every month to play cards. Just like you and me. All he did then was his duty. What the Americans do today, the same bloody experiments which Mengele carried out there. Everybody knows Mengele here. <laughs> yes. And I would be prepared to support it myself. What we were trying to do then was to rid ourselves of society's cripples. You can take that as you like. And when I look at them all today, the way they all run around here, all I can say is that Mengele didn't do anything more than scratch the surface. Eight years ago, I saw him for the first time at a farm. Since I've been here, I see him every four weeks. Certainly. Hide him? Well, no, I wouldn't need to hide him. The president says he's a Paraguayan citizen. I needn't say any more. Stresner helps him. There's no need for Stresner to help him. Listen. Everything here is run by different laws. And what is it you don't understand? When we began to press Muller for details of how Mengler received his money, he grew increasingly suspicious. He'd got a brother who was a millionaire in Germany. How do I get my money from Germany? In Deutschmark checks, which I change on the black market, and then I've got my money. That's no problem. <laughs> do you have to ask such stupid questions? You shouldn't. Leave Mangala alone. Now you are beginning to sound dangerous to me. Now we'll have to find out what you're really up to. You should stop asking stupid questions. This man certainly knows where Joseph Mengele is today. He's his lawyer in Paraguay, Luis Maria Argaña, a friend of President Stresner, a palace visitor, as shown by this presidential visiting list. Argania was sent to Washington this summer to defend Paraguay's appalling record on human rights. Argania specializes in defending criminals and Nazis who fled to Paraguay against extradition. Argania is in contact through Swiss intermediaries with this man, Fritz Steinacker, Mengler's lawyer in Germany. Steinacker's Frankfurt-based firm defends Nazi war criminals in Germany today. Fritz Steinacker acted for Mengler in the recent West German investigation into his crimes. It's the existence of this legal chain that's convinced the West German authorities that Joseph Mengele is still alive and well. Judge Horst von Glasenapp. Uh, his lawyer is Mr. Fritz Steinecker. Steinecker at Frankfurt, yes. A follower of Laternes is a famous one who was in Nuremberg, if you know the name, the Nuremberg trial. How well do you know Mr. Steinecker? Oh, well, look, I am long in, uh, in, in Frankfurt courts and I know him uh, more than 10 or 15 years ago or longer ago. Do you think Mr. Steinecker would have been told had Mengele died? I think so. And do you think Mr. Steinecker would have passed that information to you? Of course, there's no doubt about it. I'm sure. Do you think uh, Mengele is still alive? I think so. Uh, otherwise, uh, there are a lot of people who know me and they would, uh, they would tell me if he died or so. 
Like the Israelis and West Germans, we never had direct contact with Joseph Mengele in Paraguay. But we believe the evidence points to his continued protection there by President Stresner, who personally refused to strip Mengler of Paraguayan citizenship despite repeated West German requests up to last year. Personally banned this newspaper from publishing a Mengele story in July 1977 that would have revealed one of his border hideouts. Allowed his interior ministry in 1977 to deny any knowledge of Mengler's whereabouts when the West German embassy inquired about their extradition requests first submitted in 1962. Finally, Enrique Muller, leader of a violent Nazi gang, claims Mengele lives in Paraguay with President Stresner's approval. I wouldn't like to see him that he should die. Definitely not. I would like to see him, he should be in life for the rest of his life and to suffer. Yes, this is which I would like to see him. He should be in life and he should be suffering, he should hear the survivors to tell him what he did with us. I mean, you can, can never feel safe if you have the whole world who is writing and doing and acting against you. I don't suppose that he can ever feel very safe. Do you think Mengler will ever be caught? I don't think so. I don't think so.